For the next talk, Lennart is going to talk to us about, surprise, surprise, TPMs. Let's welcome Lennart. So I was a bit sick yesterday, so I don't have the usual energy that I uh, otherwise have, but I hope it's sufficient for the talk. Uh, if you have any questions, please interrupt me. I'd uh, rather have the, the questions right away instead of just at the end. Um, this talk's supposed to be kind of a successor talk to a talk very similarly named that I did last year. And it's uh, supposed to be an update of uh, about everything that has changed in systemd regarding TPM stuff since last year, and what's now on the agenda for the next uh, uh, time. Yeah, um, just to give you a little bit of a uh, um, recap on the goals, right? Like this, basically, I literally copied this from the last year's slides, but just uh, to make everyone understand what the what the goal is that I actually have with all of this, right? Like, so the general goal is to catch up with what other OSs have, right? Like. Uh, most relevant OSs nowadays have by default TPM or some equivalent measurement system integrity concept. Windows has it, Android has it, Chrome OS has it, Mac OS has it, um, like the, the iPhone OS has it. Everybody has it. So uh, the goal here really is to kind of catch up with that so that ideally generic Linux distributions have the same level of uh, uh, system integrity. Um, this specifically means that we can default to measured boot and actually uh, lock um, disk encryption and things to, to that. That uh, we, however, not only focus on disk encryption, but all kinds of other encryption, like on systemd specifically, this means credentials for systems, uh, for services, um, uh, which is basically a secure way to parameterize keys and, and the configuration and secrets and things like that for services. Um, Another goal is a secure parameterization of boot. Like I think many of the talks um, in this room earlier today kind of glanced over this already. Um, yeah, when we do, uh, when we have a trusted boot, um, uh, then we somehow need to pass parameter, uh, parameters into this. Um, I mean, this like like for for single purpose OSs is not so important, but uh, if we actually want to go for generic OSs, this parameterization always uh, matters because you want to configure this or that or something else. So, and that always implies some form of uh, authentication first. Uh, confidential computing um, is also uh, pretty relevant because like uh, on a uh, confidential computing system you kind of have to have this otherwise the whole exercise is pretty pointless. Um, uh, one goal is also to open up TPM usage for other purposes um, so that we provide, you know, if, we, if, you've, if you want to use the TPM properly you, you, you kind of have to uh, provide OS um, primitives for doing policies on these objects that you ma manage in the DPM. And with systemd, with systemd PCR log, which we'll talk about later, this is kind of the goal. Um, yeah. In general, the goal is to be good enough so that this can be turned off in generic Linux and is not something that distributions have to think about anymore. It's not an add-on feature or something that hence has a likely chance to not work, but it's more something that is just core part of the OS. That is the goals. But uh, of course, it's uh, still far off to actually come there. Uh, then here another recap about all the components. Um, I think many of them I introduced in my last year's talk. Um, this time I just compressed it into one slide. Um, I hope most of you probably are already aware of these. A very quick uh, um, uh, summary of what they do. Systemd crypt setup is like this integration thing that is similar to the low-level crypt setup that can unlock disks and do TPM stuff and a couple of other things like FIDO and things so on. <laughs> Systemd crypt and roll is kind of the counterpart to it that sets up this, the disk for this. Systemd PCR extend um, is a tool that can measure stuff um, like uh, uh, to PCRs and Soon, other things. Systemd PCR phase is the same thing, but uh, um, it's it's a it's a multi-call binary, and PCR phase focuses on measuring the boot phase, um, so that you have something that you can use inside of your uh, TPM policies that you can basically say uh, this disk shall only be um, unlockable um, in the inner D, but not after. Uh, Systemd PCR machine is supposed to measure it, some like the, the machine ID uh, primarily, um, so that we have uh, some PCR that can reflect the system identity. System PCR FS is pretty closely related to that. It measures the 
identity of, of uh, the file systems used because to a large degree NOS is defined by the file system is located on. Systemd stub is this EFI stub that uh, uh, runs in UFI mode shortly before the kernel initializes, picks up uh, various things, measures a couple of things and then hands control to the actual kernel. Systemd measure is a tool to offline um, predict um, and sign uh, the measurements that a kernel that is equipped with systemd stub will make. Um, it's mostly supposed to be used offline so that vendors can uh, can uh, uh, prepare signed um, predictions of the PCR values. Um, UKEY-FI has been mentioned many times, I think, uh, in the earlier talks. It's this thing that builds um, unified kernel images for you based on a kernel in RD and all the other parts. System PCR log is, uh, I think, my, my uh, talk here at this conference last year introduced that. Um, uh, the first time I, I publicly talked about this is it's supposed to be this this uh, um, management tool that can uh, create local PCR policies based on uh, uh, one is inherently not vendor controlled or as vendor controlled, but is inherently local to the system. Um, I don't know, c c captures local firmware and, and things like this, um, and can also lock down configuration, like yeah, basically everything that's local and that the OS vendor cannot possibly predict on the build machines. System report is kind of related to this. Um, it's a is a dynamic repartitioner, and it's relevant in the TPM context because it can uh, uh, run at early boot on the on the first boot, basically create an encrypted disk partition and then roll it to TPM. Uh, System creds um, and uh, import credentials is a the, I mentioned this briefly earlier. It's about the secure parameterization of uh, services and systems too, by the way, um, uh, so that we can pass little bits of information into services and they are um, decrypted, like they're, they're generally encrypted, but they're decrypted the moment that the service is activated um, and that in a way that is locked to TPM. So, um, one thing I would like to make clear is that um, yeah, like the security model that I go for, of course, whenever you try to build a secure system, you need to know what, what the security model is that you subscribe to. Um, like I, uh, I, I, let me make clear before we uh, uh, continue that my focus is really on measured boot very much and not so much on secure boot, right? Like, you know, measured boot is this thing where, where we basically allow everything to boot but make measurements about um, each time we, we uh, jump into something and into the next step. Um, and then can bind security to this. Secuboot is the thing where we, before we invoke something, we verify a signature. I think in the long run, you know, as we move to image-based systems, um, I think the the security that you provide must be hooked, much, like must be based much more on measured boot than on secure boot, because I see the systematic problem that secure boot doesn't really scale like with with high frequency generation of new images, right? Like because you need to get your stuff signed, that makes it complex, um, right? Like it's it's not as trivial anymore as building a local image locally and just deploying it. You have to build it, sign it, and uh, and that involves all kinds of bureaucracy. Maybe even talking to Microsoft to get a signing key approved and things like that. So um, while I think Secureboot might be useful, um, and particularly when you enroll your own keys, um, I think uh, it's not what we should base our security policy on. I think measured boot is much more interesting in this, and much more democratic, if you so will, because anyone can just set this up and then basically say that on, in, a, in a tofu mode, basically say, yeah, on first like first time I start the system, I lock uh, my disk encryption to the state it is uh, currently in, and then uh, for future boots, um, I just go like uh, I don't allow deviation from that um, setup. Um, I mean, there's also the underlying, like at least how Secuboot is currently deployed, like with everything tied to Microsoft, uh, Microsoft's keys and Microsoft's basically giving everybody their own keys and approving them. Um, I think the security benefit of Secuboot is relatively limited because nobody's actually reviewing what what is signed there. Anyway, I wanted to just mention this um, that this is kind of what I care about. For I know that others disagree with this and think Secuboot is the best thing in the world. Um, but again, this is like, I'm not saying that you shouldn't use Secaboot, I'm just saying that um, I think measured boot is where the security angle comes from because, um, yeah, you can actually lock your secrets to, to measured boot. You cannot really, like, I mean, you can do that to Secaboot too, but um, because the default is so wide open, it's useless. Okay, so much about the, everything uh, that I want to, uh, wanted to, to um, make clear before we uh, go to the actual technical details. Um, so let's uh, now jump on the actual technical details, unless somebody has any question about this stuff so far. But I see no hands up. Okay, so uh, um, what's new? Um, 
One of the, the things I most recently worked on, which I think are kind of important, is, uh, and this has come up before between the lines in some of the talks here, is uh, uh, until recently um, you had the systemd PCR log policies, which were, were the ones that are, cover inherently local stuff, I just mentioned this, and the other ones are the signed PCR policies, which are supposed to cover um, the stuff that is uh, under control of the US vendor. Until recently, we had no way to combine these policies, which is uh, quite um, a gap. Uh, and it was very hard to figure out how we can actually combine these in a sensible way. Um, because, uh, yeah, TPM policies don't really allow to combine these kind of policies. Um, uh, this is because, like, the underlying primitive is, like, for one of them is called pol pol policy authorized NV, and the other primitive is called policy authorized. And you just, while well, you're in theory, can combine any kind of policy uh, that the, like, any kind of uh, policy primitive that the TPM provides you with in any way, these two you cannot. Um, I had uh, many discussions with uh, TCG people and, and others about, like, how the hell can we solve this problem? Uh, people came up with lots of ideas, and all of them were horrible because, like, most of them involved like not putting these two policies on equal footing. Um, by equal footing, I mean that, um, like, you know, the way they, they the solutions that were suggested is that we basically say that the local policy says you're also the, the the vendor policy needs to be fulfilled. But in this case, this would mean they are not on equal footing because the local policy could be changed to say no, do not care about the global one. Um, and hence, the local one would be more important than the global, uh, the, the vendor one. So, uh, um, yeah, the solution in the end was really easy, just adding key sharding. So basically, that we do the actual disencryption with a, a key that's twice as long as uh, we normally need, and then one half of it uh, um, we protect with one policy, and the other uh, with the other, which uh, should provide all the security properties that we need. It's, uh, I mean, it would be better if we could express this with TPM primitives instead of doing this with. Uh, OS concepts, like OS level concepts. Um, but uh, anyway, I think from security perspective, everything's fine now. Um, which basically means at this point in time, I would start recommending distributions to just do this, right? Like sign your UKIs, um, like ship your UKIs with systemd measure prepared to PCR. Uh, signatures and uh, um, start doing system to PCR lock um, for local policies. And then uh, um, I think I changed everything so that by default now, if uh, both of these are there, we'll stop making use of both of these in combination. And I think this is the model that we should go for. Um, any question so far? Otherwise, I would just, I mean, I'm going cont to continue doing this, right? Like just iterating through all the stuff that is a question. But uh, um, so, but I would much prefer if we have a discussion. Just very quickly, uh, making the key twice as large still means that it's going to be hashed for the actual key, or is it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So there's there's the this is done before basically the Lux key man uh, slot management thingy, um, so um, it will hash it further, right? So, secure boot and measured boot are not the same thing. Secure boot involves signatures. Certificate authorities, shim, that kind of stuff. Correct. No, well, I mean, strictly speaking, measure boot can involve that too. But yes. Yeah. So, is measured boot technically UEFI, or is it something else? Like uh, um, the the secure boot stuff is older than the measured boot stuff because secure boot is something you can implement purely in software, and this is one of the things that UEFI introduced and has been there around for a long time. A measured boot is something you need a discrete, or not necessarily discrete, but you need a TPM in some form for this, right? Like because they, it's basically about um, having these special registers, PCRs, um, that can do like hashing. Like I mean, strictly speaking, they're very similar because um, uh, one of them hashes and looks for a signature um, before it executes code. And the other one just does the, the, the measurement, which is a fancy word for hashing and storing the hash um, somewhere. And then you do the um, uh, signature checking later, like, for example, with the, with the signing policy that I was um, uh, suggesting. So it's mostly the difference is, uh, I guess, uh, uh, the, the cryptographic um, distinction isn't really there. Both is t dealing with signatures of stuff that was hashed, except that one doesn't forbid you of booting things, and the other one does, if you follow what I mean. Yep, thank you. 
Okay, um, otherwise we'll go to the next one. Uh, one thing that I, I, I think is kind of relevant is, I mean, it's not directly TPM stuff, but also it's kind of TPM stuff, which is multi-profile UKIs. Um, I think uh, the wider Linux ecosystems kind of has accepted UKIs as their new god, which is great, but UKIs bring certain problems with them, um, and we added various things of uh, dealing with these pro uh, uh, problems like PE add-ons and these kind of things. But one thing that I re relatively recently added was um, multi-profile UKIs. Um, multi-profile UKIs basically means that you can have one UKI that results in multiple uh, menu entries in the boot menu and uh, uh, um, uh, you can pick one of them and then that's the uh, 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 profile that's going to be booted. And a profile is just a combination of various PE sections, right? So you basically can say, I want to use the same kernel image, but I want to use it with three different init RDs or something. Um, and then uh, each of these combinations becomes a menu entry and then the user can select something there. The primary use case for this is that you do not do this for init RDs, but you do it for the .cmd line part so that you can have like um, three different kernel command lines lines, um, and uh, uh, the use case would then, for example, be that you have one for, I don't know, recovery boot, um, and one for factory reset, or one for whatever the fuck you want to, to have it, like this is entirely up to you. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it makes you guys a lot more useful, um, because yeah, you can implement all these various things, um, and do not have to, to, to do any external uh, um, tooling for this anymore. Um, if you use multi-profile multi UKIs, they're a natural extension for the classic UKIs. Um, in this case, the firmware will measure the full UKI with all its profiles, but then systemd stub only measures the selected combination of PE sections. Um, this, I patched this through to all the components that we have, like systemd measure, UK file, systemd stub, boot control, so that they all understand these multi-profile multi UKIs. Any question regarding that? There is a question. So let's say you have a UKI with three init RDs and you want to add a fourth one. Can you just update the UKI or do you have to completely regenerate it with all init RDs? Um, so the, <laughs> the way, uh, like because I was a lazy person, the way I implemented the, the code in uh, 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 UKI is that you actually take a base UKI and then you extend it with one profile, and then you can call UKFI again for each profile. But of course, um, like if uh, you can only do this safely before you secure boot sign it, right? Like uh, you cannot just take somebody's secure boot signed UKFI UKI and insert some additional stuff. Obviously not. But uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, it was the quickest way to get to something working is that we do this incremental build, right? Like you have one UKI and then you extend it with another profile and then another profile and so on. Thank you. Another question. Um, what is the limit of, in terms of number of command lines you can store in one UKI? I guess there is a PE section thingy. Sorry, coming in. Um, how many command lines can you store in the same UKI? Uh, I think there's a limit that is, uh, um, like we make no limit on this, this is uh, in PE, and I think it's 30 to bit. Um, okay. <laughs> Minus Look at the, the specs. I, I don't actually know. Like uh, we do whatever the fuck PE does. We make no additional restrictions. And PE is this weird format that is 32 bit even on 64 bit machines, except for very few fields. It's way different from ELF there. Like in ELF, when they went to 64 bit, they doubled the size of basically all fields. Um, uh, PE didn't do this, um, so my educated guess would be it's some 32 bit value of sections you can have. Um, but you need to spend at least. Um, uh, uh, two sections per profile, so you can have two to 31 probably in most. Not, not enough for Nix, though. But that's an dedicated guess. <laughs> Check the specs. Um, what's new? new uh, next new, like uh, system credentials I already talked, uh, or service credentials I already talked uh, about them. What we did recently is that we opened them up for unprivileged users. Um, so uh, um, this also meant that systemd creds kind of had to become a, a little IPC servers because um, we cannot assume that unprivileged users get access to the TPM. Um, so there's now a service um, uh, uh, that you can talk to and get your stuff encrypted or decrypted. Um, and it will uh, um, has this nice little trick that it actually includes the identity information of the client, meaning user ID, uh, 
uh, and things like that in the uh, encryption logic so that basically um, if you want to have your credential unlocked, you need to be the same user on the on the same system with the same TPM uh, and things like that. Um, so uh, this is something that the Gnome users, like we had a talk early in the morning uh, regarding the Fido stuff where they want to make use of this. I actually would like to extend this further so that we also include information about the C group of the client because it would suddenly be interesting because C groups in, 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 in effectively are an identifier for the service um, and hence the app. So we could perhaps have something like app scoped um, uh, uh, credentials, like encrypted credentials, which I think would be extremely useful. Um, so that only an app that gets uh, configured inside of a specific C group name, foobar or something, gets um, access to the credentials. And this is enfor enforced cryptographically. Um, also, I mean, this this already it requires that we have a system service because, of course, we need to make sure that, uh, that uh, um, yeah, the uh, the UID information that we get uh, from the kernel is actually included in the in the, um, the encryption key, basically. Um, and this basically, in a way, uh, like TPMs usually enforce policies that the TPM know about. Um, the user identity, of course, is not a concept of TPMs; it's a com concept of the West, and hence we have to add it in at the West level. Any questions about this? Yes, one question. there. Then I have a question. Actually, while I work there, I can ask it. So, because it was mentioned in the previous talk this morning, uh, for credentials we do the sealing and encryption in, on the CPU because we have the key on the on var and we mix them together. Uh, that means uh, an attacker that can access to that can get the keys. It would it make sense to have a mode where credentials are encrypted in the TPM instead, so that the OS can never see the private material? I think uh, that's already what happens. Like uh, what the the only uh, like so if you use system credentials, um, there are two keys maintained. One key is in the TPM, and the other one is in the file system. The only reason why it is in the file system is because you can have multiple like you have multi boot, right? Like you can have multiple OSs on the same system. And I thought it would be weird if we allow um, that. Uh, yeah, if I install Fedora and Arch Linux on my system, that the Fedora thing could decode my. Uh, um, uh, uh, Arc Linux secrets, if you so will, right? It's also there so that if we detect we are on a TPM less system, right, like that, that doesn't have a TPM, that we have something reasonable to fall back. And that's basically a secret that we store in Varlib somewhere uh, with restricted permissions. But, um, like, the assumption is that, that in a world where everybody has a TPM, the TPM uh, blocks this and is uh, providing the actual security, and the other thing is just an also there that so doesn't make things worse. But the security is hooked to the TPM, not to anything else. And we do not decode any secret from the TPM. We, like, on every um, encryption and decryption of credentials, we always go to the TPM and let the TPM do the work. Um. Yes, so I would like to go back to what you mentioned about application-specific credentials. Um, is there any reason for why, like, is there any relation with the kernel curing, and why do we need to use C groups where maybe, for example, systemd could like manipulate the kernel curing to store the key somewhere, and we could have a nice um, interface where we could request credential that could go up to the graphical interface saying, oh, please give me your email password, then it gets cached into the kernel curing only for that specific application that requested uh, the, the password, and like, interesting workflow can, 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 can start. Um, so, I mean, there, this is a certainly a thing, right? Like, um, uh, we have discussed, for example, in the HomeD concept that we would have a per-user secret that HomeD maintains for every user, basically, that is not the secret that users log in, but is something derived of the volume key of uh, the home directory and would include that into the credential stuff uh, as well. So, which is very similar to what you suggest. I don't know, like, kernel keyring I have a love and hate relationship with that. Me too, um, but uh, it's maybe like it needs you to could do it. it in there. But the thing is, like, uh, we want a delegation system, right? Uh, somewhere where where um, these things are overridden down the tree. And I don't know. We already have the C group thing. Like, ultimately, what we want to lock to against here is not necessarily secret. Um, but. I don't know, like, it might make sense to have something like this. I've thought about this if we should introduce a concept of a per-service credential 
uh, like a, a per service secret basically that we give everybody. But uh, um, I don't know. I need more use cases before we do something like this because that would be primarily a, a service facing new API, new concept, and it would be pretty useless if people wouldn't actually be willing uh, to use this kind of thing. I think uh, the per user uh, uh, thing, we would be our own users, uh, like like consumers of this very quickly. So I think we can add this because we have a very clear use case for this. But the, I'm not sure if, like I, I kind of have the suspicion that people who write services probably, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, they, they don't want to do their own crypto. They just want to have a way how they can get the fucking secrets that they have and if we supply to them great but uh, if we give them just a secret which they can use to do encryption with um, then you might lose a lot of people so I don't know it's a, it's a, it's a raw inf interface and I think we need to give them a, a higher level interface where they don't have to, to, to do these so that's an answer I don't know I'm, I'm open to discussing this um, I'm not just at this point convinced that this is something we should deliver um, because that makes I sense. see that it might be difficult to get people to use this Anything else at this point? Otherwise, let's go to the next one. Um, uh, this came up in uh, last year's talk um, uh, about the event lock. We nowadays have an a JSON based uh, event lock, JSON CL. Uh, event lock, um, so that it implements a TCG standard. It's not entirely JSON CL though, because uh, JSON, like the CL spec from TCG, is kind of wonky. Um, like in, in, it defines, for example, a record number that should be included in every event lock entry. And that basically means that if you want to attach something to the end, um, you always have to read the front to actually figure out what the, the next number is going to be that you append. And I decided that this is just wasteful, right? Like because event logs can grow and will grow uh, longer. And every time we add something, we have to count this or cache the value. This is just messy. So my solution to this is do not include the record number. Um, but it's trivial to convert to the real thing, right? Like if you just iterate through all the objects we write there and add an increasing record number, then you're there. So um, yeah, so it is basically JSON cell, but not really JSON cell, but trivially, trivial to, to convert. Um, there's a varlink based API um, to actually include your own um, uh, measurements in this. It's, uh, it will do the event log update and the PCR stuff as atomic as we can do these things together. Of course, we cannot really do them atomic, but we provide locking and everything. Um, this has one primary consumer, which is systemd PCR log. The new measurement API um, via Varlink, I'm not sure how useful is, it is actually at this point, because uh, uh, if you want to start measuring something, you need to have a PCR that you can measure it to. Um, and there are no free PCRs. So uh, yeah, great that we have this API. I don't know if how useful is this. The next slide, uh, I think it's the next slide, uh, we'll talk about what we can do about this though. Um, yeah, but I think conceptually it's something we definitely want. Um, and hence, it's already there. Yeah, any question regarding this? Okay, um, or it's not the next slide, but let's talk then about this first. Uh, one thing that I, I realized uh, working a lot with TPMs, there is a disagreement how TPMs shall be available to the OS, like uh, OS, like conceptually, because uh, um, some people assume that TPM are this piece of hardware that is always accessible to the OS, but that's simply not true. Like, first of all, in Linux we do, I don't know, uh, compile drivers as uh, kernel modules, um, in particular in generic distributions, um, because there are many drivers that you have, and uh, um, yeah, you don't always want to uh, uh, have them in the kernel. But even if we would link all drivers into the kernel, there are still environments, and many of those, uh, where you have, uh, because TPMs are ultimately just an API. They are not a hardware uh, specification so much as primarily a way how you talk to one of these things. And I think we're moving into this world, and particularly in the, in the, in the clouds and stuff, where TPMs are going to be vTPMs, right? So and that often implies that they need to be started first, right? Like that there's a user space component um, that starts them, there's one, for example, Opti that does this, um, but uh, even in, in generic, generic OSs, I think this is where, where things are going, right? Like that you have, I don't know, some enclave, some VM, encrypted VM or something um, that actually does the TPM stuff and then might be backed by a real TPM or might not be. Um, but this kind of implies uh, that uh, the TPM is not always available. It's just um, uh, uh, available from some point on. And uh, uh, so accepting that this is how it is, uh, we added um, a 
synchronization point to system reboot, basically, where, which just says when the TPM is available. And anything that wants to access the TPM, like for measurements, for, for unlocking disks and things like that, needs to be ordered after that. So, uh, yeah, summary is basically we, we support opti and generic distributions that do not compile all TPM drivers into the kernel better with this. Um, uh, any questions so far? There is a question. Aaron. Uh, at, at what time in boot is that synchronization target? Because I assume that in early boots you also want to measure things to the TPM, right? How does yeah, that work? It's, it's in the already. Okay. So it's a, uh, that point should usually be reached very shortly, hopefully after the inner But after UDEF started doing its thing, right? Uh, like because UDEF is a thing that might make this stuff available. Uh, and if you're not using systemd in it RD, then you're, then I guess it doesn't. I don't understand that question. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or if you boot without an init RD, for example, and you just boot into well, you know, if space. you if you uh, work without systemd, then you're fucked, right? Like you have to to add all the synchronization points yourself. I mean. And you need to run demons, right? I don't know. Like no, but if I you mean, in stage two, you run systemd, and I suppose some of the early boot components measure things into the TPM, or do they not? Is there Sorry, I didn't understand no. that. Like, are there any early boot components in stage two that measure things into the TPM, and can they? What do you mean by stage two? Like, like okay, like the, the the not in the init RD, but in the the, the root FS where we switch. Into, like yes, we yeah. do. We measure like a lot of places now. The phase, right? Like um, so. Basically, the way how it works is now that the PCRs are generally available during uh, firmware phases, right? Like SD boot and, and so on. They generally get access because firmware uh, provides this, even in op opti worlds and, and things like, like uh, enclave worlds. Um, but this is only for measurement. And then you transition to the kernel. The kernel has no access to the TPM usually as long as it initializes. Then the inner D gets control. Um, then we wait exactly as long as we need for the TPM to show up. Then we do the first measurement that we reach the inner ID phase, um, uh, then we do stuff, possibly unlock the root file system, then immediately before we um, uh, leave the inner ID, we do another measurement, then we um, transition to the root FS, then we do another measurement that we reach the root FS, basically, um, then we another measurement when we just started um, like running regular services, and finally we do another measurement when we're ready. And then during shutdown, we do a couple of measurements as well. Thanks. So um, th yeah, I don't think you, the question was if you don't do the interd to root of transition, how do you do this? If you ever you call them USI unified system image or whatever else you came up with. In that case, if the TPM commit comes up late, then you are screwed. I think the answer there is build build it in the kernel. Don't do kernel modules or anything, right? You get it, the question. Um, like a USI for me is basically where you build an init RD that claims not to be an inner RD, right? Yeah, exactly. But if you activate the TPM halfway to the boot of that, what do you do before that if you need to measure stuff? That is the question. I mean, in this case, of course, um, there would be no inner RD uh, uh, measurements being made because you never were in, in the inner RD in the sense that systemd understands it. I mean, you would wrap it up as a CPIO and add it to the kernel as an inner RD, but then from uh, you wouldn't have Etsy an inner RD release file in there, which is how systemd detects if it's an inner RD, right? So, um, so from systemd perspectives, you're not an inner RD, even if from the kernel perspectives you are. Um, and then hence these two measurements about the inner RD would not happen, but the TPM 2. target would still uh, apply, right? Like, but, so but the question is, do we have measurements that we do before that? That is the question. No, the first measurement that we do from user space mm -hmm. is the one that we just entered the init RD. And if we have no, no init RD in this sense, uh, then the first measurement would be the one that we entered the root of us. OK. Yes. What about things that happen after measured boot in, in, in user space? Is systemd involved in any of that? I mean, you, you mentioned udev and how, you know, like, I used the TPM to two command line tools to do things like my. So, uh, um, I mean, part of this, what I'm talking about here next somewhere is, uh, yeah, I, I would like to get to a world where we actually measure 
lo lots of things during the whole runtime. Like for example, that uh, systemd confex and sysx, right? These things that that are extensions uh, that extend Etsy and, and user, that we uh, make measurements when we apply them, or that systemd endspawn when it starts a container, it measures uh, the image that it does. Um, it's a different use case though, right? Like uh, the way I see it, um, the the early boot time stuff, right? The firmware stuff until um, basically the boot settled. Um, that is most like the, the, the primary use case is probably f um, for that is uh, disk encryption, right? Or any other kind of like credential encryption or something like this, right? Like so, where you can nicely predict stuff. Um, the other part, right? Like during runtime, you know, if we do a measurement for every container that starts and stops and starts and stops, right? This is not something that settles. This is something that goes on for 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 all eternity, right? Um, so this is not not realistically predictable, right? Like because you don't know, like uh, during the runtime of your node, what what's it gonna start and stop and start and stop, right? So the use case for that kind of stuff is remote attestation, right? Which is very different, um, like uh, uh, use case, even though technically it's not that different, right? Like you still validate your, your event log. So. Um, Right now, the functionality that we provide and release to some versions mostly um, deals with the stuff until it settles. But I think uh, we should, uh, like, and, and much of the work I'm doing is to, to extend this for the remote attestation stuff as well. So uh, that basically we always know exactly, you know, like I want to come to the system definition where for every file on the system we can cryptographically make a proof um, where it comes from, right? Um, and this is kind of part of, 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 of that thing. So, uh, yeah. yeah. That answers my question. Thank you. Um, what else is new? Systemd PCR log. We talked about what that is. Um, uh, it's a varlink. Uh, it now has a varlink IPC interface. Um, this is in particular to request policy rebuilds, uh, which is supposed to be used by things that I don't know. FW updatee, for example, when they update uh, the firmware, because if you update the firmware, the measurements will change. And in particular, if we have no golden uh, measurements for for, for these uh, firmware updates, then you have to temporarily uh, loosen the policy a little bit. Like you have to kick out the firmware-related measurements from your from your policy so that you later then lock it down against in what you actually saw so uh, for that we added a varlink ipc interface uh, what's also pretty uh, relevant is that system PC log now places a second copy of of the policy data that is generates in the sp um well this is slide doesn't make sense now places a copy of generated copy uh, I apparently didn't proofread this. It was, anyway, so yeah, it places a copy of a generated copy in the ESP um, uh, of the of the policy generates, and this is crucial because uh, the systemd pre unlock policy is what you need to unlock the root file system, right? So. Um, However, if you needed to unlock the root file system, it needs to be available at inner ID times. It's one of these questions of secure parameterization, except that we cannot actually encrypt this data, which is usually what we do for, for secure parameterization, because after all, it contains the information that we need to unlock the, 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 the uh, encryption of the TPM. Um, but anyway, so key really is uh, we now manage this automatically, so that if you, use pop, that you finally can use PCR lock uh, uh, reasonably for the root effects itself. <coughs> We have only a couple of um, of uh, minutes left. I got some smaller things here on the list. Um, I think I'm going to skip over this and very quickly go just to what's next, um, just to have mentioned this. Um, and VPCRs is kind of the next thing. Um, like I mentioned earlier, that we now have the log and we have the measurement APIs, but it's not so useful because there are no PCRs left. Um, but uh, yeah, NVPCR is supposed to be a solution to this because uh, TPMs actually have a concept called NV indexes, which are like these little bits of memory that you can use on the TPM and uh, that are persistent. Um, and you can use them in many ways. And one way is to uh, uh, you can use them as uh, additional PCRs, which is really weird actually because NV, as the name suggests, is non-volatile. PCRs are inherently volatile, right? Like they're supposed to reset when you boot. And I don't know how else. I would call that then very much volatile. Um, but anyway, you can use them like this. Um, so basically, this would make the allocation of them non-volatile, but the contents volatile. Um, and uh, this basically allows us to have more PCRs. And that is kind of necessity uh, for the stuff that I was talking about earlier, where we start uh, measuring uh, convex, sysx, containers, and things like this. Because uh, yeah, we need more PCRs for this. So um, I talked to TCG and stuff like that, and they're actually going to assign a NV index range to us. Like NV index is identified by 32-bit integers, basically. Um, so there's no file names, no other kind of sensible naming. There's just numbers. Um, hence, it's essential that. Uh, um, 
we have uh, like an ID range, like a number range assigned to us, and they said that they're going to do this, and then they wrote it on it, but then they figured out that maybe they don't want to do this for every open source project that comes along, and wanted us to assign it to Linux, whatever that is, instead. Um, so we convinced them, I think, like they still haven't voted about this, um, to assign it to the UAPI group. Um, it, once we have this, uh, basically anyone who needs an NV index for any purpose whatsoever can come to that group and we'll hand it out um, to them. Them like a sub range, like further delegation. Um, yeah, I think my time's mostly over. Um, I think the future is looking bright then because we actually can measure everything we want. But the very few, the very little time I've left, I would like to spend on questions. <clears throat> uh, thanks for the update. If my memory serves me well, I remember we discussed few years ago at some conference, uh, the Home uh, D, uh, the double encryption of Home D, when, uh, when Home D is stored on uh, encrypted root, uh, when uh, homes are uh, stored on encrypted root. And uh, I believe uh, you said that uh, then that uh, we shouldn't actually encrypt root because, uh, because uh, it's from the distribution, so there are no secret things. Uh, we can rebuild it, uh, and now you're you're talking about uh, about uh, decrypting root with with TPM and and so. Uh, so what about double encryption of ho uh, homes? So no. the model I'm going for is that slash user is only a DM variety protected, and that the root FS, which contains Etsy and var and home, um, is DM crypt uh, uh, encrypted, right? So. Uh, uh, I think OS resources don't make any sense to encrypt. Um, they need to be authenticated, however, and uh, uh, the other stuff needs to be encrypted. Um, but uh, I don't know how this looks in the end, right? Like, you know, for example, there has been, uh, people have added support for Opal, like for hardware encryption. Um, I think it might make sense to, because Opal is kind of free, right? Like, because um, the hardware does the encryption for you and there's no latency involved and things like that. It comes at a much weaker level of security, though, right? Like, because it's opaque to the operating system, they don't know what's going on. And Microsoft, for example, they turned off Opal support in Windows because many of the hardware manufacturers were found out to lie on the Opal stuff. Um, so, but I think it might be good enough uh, to avoid the double encryption thing with HomeD, right? Like, so that if we can basically say, I have, I have the home directory, it's going to be Opal protected, but then HomeD inside of it, right? Because then you get the strong properties from the HomeD stuff, um, but you still get some weak form of integrity pseudo functionality from Opal, uh, which might be enough, which, yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, it's like, you know, if you have a high level of encryption on top, then the lower level, I think, can be weaker. But uh, this is, of course, for everybody to decide. But yes. Um, I hope that gives an answer. Uh, I mean, regarding HomeD double encryption, uh, I have some ideas to reuse block crypto, which is a thing that's used in embedded Linux on like Android and, and stuff. Uh, I think it would allow us to do double encryption with no performance cost, uh, but it would require work in the kernel. Um, I'm going to talk more about it tomorrow in my HomeD talk. Okay. In an earlier talk today, um, there was mention that um, if you use the TPM module very heavily, sometimes they crash. That's the first thing. What does system D then? Because the more we use that, and then the TPM module somehow crashes them, what does system what D? What do you mean by TPM module? Like? It doesn't answer anymore. It may happen. I'd say there's a bug in the firmware of the TPM. And what, hap what is with uh, suspend? So is thing, Because, I mean, I've, there's the problem that you have with Wi-Fi firmwares that you have quite often that they're going to die so, in some circumstances, or what does system D do then? I mean, it's like how it usually is, right? Like stuff that is not used much generally doesn't work, right? But then there's also the thing, Windows has been relying on TPMs for a long time, and at least I think in the professional versions by default and things like that. So generally, uh, hardware these days, the TPMs are fine. They'll not be great, but they could be good enough. Um, uh, so I don't know if, if a TPM doesn't work and we have reports about this because we start measuring something and some people have run into problems with this. Um, I think uh, uh, it's a, like, it's like any driver you have, it needs to be fixed. And I think uh, as we start actually making use of this, um, uh, uh, they will be, 
And uh, we're in, in the luxurious position that we come 15 years later than Windows and all the other ones did, so they probably solved all the worst shit for us. Uh, that said, um, like, uh, you know, because we have the luxury that we come f came from 15 years later, like systemd PCR lock and the signed PCR policies both make use of functionality that was simply not available in TPMs when Windows started this thing. So uh, um, this makes our life much nicer. We have much nicer security properties because of that, because we don't have to deal with rollback issues and things like this. But um, it also means that this functionality, of course, not, not as well tested. But uh, I don't know, like because most of the TPM firmware just copies nowadays the reference implementation. Um, uh, uh, most of the bugs exposed um, uh, are kind of the bugs that everybody has, and we can probably deal with this. This is my assumption. Regarding full disk encryption, um, Syscaller, which is a kind of fuzzer, has a, a, a big load of open file system bugs. If you, do you know Syscaller, the kind of fuzzer? Yeah. So it has a bunch of open file system bugs. Um, when it opens corrupted file systems, it, um, like there's a bunch of bad things happen, happening, and um, I would say the fix rate for file system bugs in Linux is kind of meh. So. Um, what is your view on using full disk encryption to protect against uh, just maliciously malformed file system images? Well, I mean, this is a fundamental problem at all, right? Like the kernel file system, people, they're very clearly that they do not consider it an issue, like a bug in their file system um, if you have a rogue file system and that exploits the kernel. And I can understand this. They are more, some of the most complex data structures we have in our uh, systems these days. So uh, that's why I think all this, integ uh, this, this uh, integ integrity tests on this need to come on the block layer below it. That's why I think DM Verity is the right thing to go for slash user and uh, DM Crypt and DM Integrity uh, for slash home, right? Like, so I am very strongly, I mean, this is some, some reason why I don't think FS Crypt and things like that that puts put the trust and the security above it are going to be a solution, right? Like, because they put the integrity and the trust on the wrong layer where you not solving the problem of first trusting your, your, your file system in the first place, right? So that's my answer. Okay, well, I think our time is over. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank very you much. very much. Uh,